Please be seated. Well, good afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters. Good afternoon, Father. So turn with me to today's gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. And let me explain what's going on, the, the, the context. Jesus is accompanied by his disciples on a trip to his hometown of Nazareth, but it doesn't go well. Instead of Jesus being like honored by the people of his own town, you know, of his own hometown, he faces rejection, disbelief from those who knew him since childhood. And the gospel tells us why, Mark chapter 6, verse 6, he, Jesus, was amazed at their lack of faith. So the question is, why did the people of his hometown of Nazareth lack faith? Why couldn't they see Jesus as a Messiah, the Savior of Israel? And I'm going to give you two reasons for their lack of faith, okay? Reason number one is, during the time of Jesus, there was a commonly held belief that no one would know where the Messiah came from. This mistaken belief is echoed in John chapter 7, verse 27, which says, we all know where he comes from. But when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So the Jewish people believed the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But apart from that, they believed that no one would know anything else about the Messiah until the day of his manifestation. Consequently, when the people asked in verse 3, is he not the, the, is he not the carpenter? Is he not the son of Mary? What they were really saying was, he can't be the Messiah because we know where he comes from. He's a carpenter. He's a son of Mary. The people of Nazareth thought they knew Jesus too well. They knew him as the carpenter, as the son of Mary. And they could not reconcile this familiarity with the extraordinary nature of the Messiah. But did they really know where Jesus came from? The answer is no. They thought they knew where Jesus came from when in fact they had no idea of Jesus' divine origin. Now the second reason that they lacked faith was their inability to see beyond the natural, the ordinary. Mark chapter 6 verse 3 they say, Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, of Joseph, of Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. They took offense at him. He can't be the Messiah, man. I know his family. Can't be them. So they couldn't go beyond their eyes what their eyes were telling them. And it's natural because they were watching, they watched Jesus grow up like a regular kid. Their eyes told them that Jesus is the carpenter. Mary is the mother. James, Joseph, Judah, Simon are his brothers. And they knew his sisters. Now, the people of Nazareth couldn't accept that someone so familiar could be the Messiah. They couldn't go beyond what their eyes were telling them. And so they lacked faith in Jesus. Now, I want to spend some time clarifying the point here. Some of our separated brethren often use this verse to claim falsely that Blessed Virgin Mary had children, other children, besides our Lord Jesus. Permit me to respond to this false claim in some detail because we've been attacked recently in these areas. Now, the original Greek word translated brother is Adelphos and for sister is Adelphe. And both of these Greek words can also be translated easily relative, cousin, nephew, uncle, brother-in-law, and even a person of the same tribe. If it's in plural, it's of the same tribe. In addition, the languages that Jesus spoke were Hebrew and Aramaic. And those languages don't have a specific term for cousin or nephew or close relative. The Jewish people could, would simply call any close relative their brother or their sister. In other words, to say that Jesus had brothers and sisters does not mean that they were children of Mary. The church has always taught that the brothers and sisters of Jesus were close relatives and Mary was and is a virgin. In fact, the Bible itself demonstrates this if you actually take the time to study it. The Gospel of John, I'm going to take the time for example. The Gospel of John chapter 19 verse 25 says, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas. 
So did you understand? St. John tells us that the mother of Jesus had a sister. To be precise, a sister-in-law. And what was the name of her sister-in-law was? Mary, the wife of? Clopas. Well, who is this Clopas? You know, this actually corresponds perfectly to the teaching of some of the early Christian historians and writers that identify Clopas as the biological brother of Saint Joseph. That means the uncle of our Lord Jesus. So Clopas' wife was also named Mary and she was the sister-in-law of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So Saint Joseph and his brother Clopas both married women that were named Mary. This is important because when the Gospel of Mark is describing the crucifixion, he tells us that there was some women who were looking on from a distance. And I quote, Mark 15, 40 says, Among them were Mary Magdalene, another Mary, and Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joses. I don't know if you paid attention there. That means that the James and Joses the, the first two brothers of Jesus, were actually the children of Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was the brother of St. Joseph. This means that James and Joseph were the cousins of Jesus, not the children of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You just got to read the Bible and study it, okay? It's not complicated. But what about the other two brothers? What about uh, the other brothers, Jude and Simon? Well, Jude, or Judas, Jude, they call him Jude, like St. Jude, that's his statue right there. They, he wrote one of the shortest letters in the New Testament, and in Jude verse 1, he introduces himself. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. That means that Jude was also a cousin of Jesus, not the son of the Virgin Mary, because he was the brother of James, and James was the son of Mary, wife of Cleopas. Now, early church historians and writers identify Simon also as the son of Cleopas, who succeeded James as the bishop of Jerusalem. Why? Because they were cousins of Jesus. They were in the line of David and said, well, someone from the house of David needs to be the bishop of Jerusalem. So, so you see, clearly these brothers were first cousins of Jesus, not biological children of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yet, we also have other reasons why the church believes that Jesus was Mary's only child. I'll briefly present five, real quick. Number one. The prophet Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 wrote that a great sign of the Messiah was that a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. We hear it every Christmas. Now, God's promise had two parts in Isaiah 7 4. One, the virgin shall be with child and two, the virgin shall bear a, a son. Now, Jesus was 30 years old when he started his public ministry. And if Mary had a lot of other children, the prophecy would have, been, would have been meaningless. And the Pharisees would have attacked any claim that Jesus was the Messiah. Why? Because if Mary was not a virgin, then Jesus wasn't the Messiah. And who would believe that Mary's a virgin if she had like, you know, six or seven kids? Nobody. Nobody. So the prophecy of Isaiah impelled Our Lady, who knew the Word of God, not to have any other biological children. Reason number two, Matthew chapter one. The genealogy of Jesus does not mention any children for St. Joseph or for Mary, only one child, Jesus. Reason number three, the Gospel of Luke chapter two. Jesus was lost for three days when he was 12 years old. And Joseph and Mary found him in the temple. That scene doesn't show any other little brothers or sisters hanging around because Jesus is the only child of Mary. Reason number four. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, from the cross, Jesus entrusted his mother to who? To the apostle John. Behold your mother. Precisely because he had no one else to entrust her to. And the gospel says, and John took her into his home. 
Why did he take Mary into his home? Because he had no other, because he had no other brother, little brothers or sisters. His disciple now was in charge of him. The final reason, number five, it's because it's been the constant faith of the church from the very beginning that Jesus was Mary's only son. Most of the early church fathers taught this and they wrote about this extensively, including St. Athanasius, year 293, St. Jerome, three, year 345, St. Augustine, year 354, St. Cyril, year 376, and many, many others. So don't believe for an instant the errors of those who attack our faith who just came on the scene a few hundred years ago. It is absolutely true that Jesus was the Blessed Virgin Mary's only son. Now here's where I want to transition to another really important topic. You and I truly are the brothers and sisters of Jesus and therefore the children of Mary by God's grace. I want to explore with you the meaning of God's grace. So what is grace? Let me give you a definition. Please repeat after me. Grace is, grace is a free and undeserved gift, a free and undeserved gift that, God gives us that God gives us to respond to our vocation, to respond to our vocation as his children. As his children. Okay. In other words, grace is not something that you can go earn or buy. You can't go to the store and say, hey, how much grace can I buy for 50 bucks? No, it's a free gift. And as Catholic Christians, we don't believe like in the law of karma. Karma depends solely on personal merit. Christians believe in the law of grace that comes from Christ, given us by the Holy Spirit. It's a totally undeserved gift. It's a gift. It's grace. Now, there are two primary types of grace. Sanctifying grace and actual grace. And we need both of them, by the way. Sanctifying grace is a gift that heals our soul from sin. And it sanctifies us and transforms us into children of God. This is a type of grace that the Holy Spirit gives us when we are baptized we, we become children of God. It makes us partakers of the divine nature and is always present in us as long as we remain in a state of sin, in a state of grace. Not in a state of sin, excuse me, in a state of grace. Sanctifying grace is sometimes called habitual grace. You know why? Because it's a permanent grace. It's like sticks to you. For example, when you are transformed into a daughter or son of God, it's a habitual grace because it's permanent. It's not something temporary. It's not like, well, today I believe I'm a child of God. Tomorrow I'm not sure if I'll be a child of God. I'll be a child of the devil maybe. Well, no, 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 no. Being a son or daughter of God is something permanent. It's something stable. It's something habitual. He changes you, and that's why it's called sanctifying grace that is habitual. Now, there's a second type of grace that is called actual grace, and I need this every day, guys. You do too. Actual grace is a temporary gift that is given to us at specific moments of our life when we need God's help. For example, in moments of strong temptation, or in moments of great need, the Holy Spirit gives you actual grace, like for right now. For example... Turn with me to the second reading, which comes from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Very powerful reading. St. Paul is really struggling with something that he calls a thorn in the flesh. Imagine that, a thorn in the flesh. And check out what he wrote to Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Therefore, that I might not become too elated, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan to beat me and to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. End of quote. Wow. St. Paul realized how utterly dependent we are on God's 
actual grace. And he asked Jesus three times to liberate him from his problem or from his big temptation, whatever that thorn in the flesh was. But Jesus didn't remove his struggles. Jesus said, nope, I ain't going to take it away. On the contrary, Jesus promised him the strength to be victorious over his struggles and over his temptations. And Jesus concluded by saying, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough for you. So if you've asked our Lord to liberate you from a certain vice, and if you ask Jesus to heal you or heal your sickness or eliminate some problem in your life or thorn in the flesh, do not be surprised if Jesus answers you, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, I need you dependent on me. You keep asking grace. In other words, I'm not going to take away your problem. Instead, I'm going to give you the grace to overcome your problem. For power is made perfect in weakness. And I'm trying to perfect you. And I'm going to do it through your weaknesses. So what is your weakness? That's my question for you today. What is your weakness? Because our Lord is inviting you to see your weakness as an opportunity to receive God's Grace, his strength, when he does for you what you can't do for yourself. Because underneath your weakness, underneath your sinfulness and spiritual poverty is an opportunity to receive a treasure of grace. So don't come before God as a superman or as a wonder woman without any needs or any problems. No. Nope. I'm Mr. and Mrs. Perfect. In fact, you can make a statue of me and put me right up there. Instead, no. Instead, come before God with your weakness, with your poverty, with your sin, with your need. And it's then that God's power will be perfected in you. Question, do you recognize your need for God's grace? If your response is yes, then you are in the perfect position to receive God's grace. For power, the power of Christ is made perfect in weakness. So when, so when you don't know what to do and the only thing left to do is to kneel before God and beg, Lord, I really need you on this one. I can't continue on my own. Please help me. It's then that you will see the powerful hand of God's grace lift you up and help you. And that you will experience God's grace in a powerful new way. Perhaps God wants you to learn that the hard times in your life are also the times when you actually grow the most spiritually. Why? Because those are the times when, the mo when Jesus most perfectly manifests his power. It's made perfect in weakness. You see, when your life is filled with difficulties, that means that God is actually giving you His grace to help you. And the important thing to remember during times of difficulty is His grace is enough for you. So do me a favor. Please tell the person next to you if there is. His grace is enough for you. Could you do that? Just turn to the person next to you. His grace is enough for you. You know... Not only it reminds me of a song titled that, but it reminds me of the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. End of quote. You see, grace begins when we honestly look at ourselves without blinders and then courageously face up to who we, who we really are at that moment. Another word for this is humility. Humility is the magnet that attracts God's grace. Humility is the moral virtue by which I acknowledge the truth of who I am. In other words, pride proclaims, I don't need God. I can do it on my own. Humility acknowledges, man, I do need God. In fact, I need God's grace right now, big time. You know, when I was a teenager and a young adult, I suffered from two addictions, alcohol and pornography. And these were huge giants for me. 
Oh, Father, I thought you were born a saint. Unfortunately, all of us are born sinners. And at times, I thought I would never overcome it. Yet with God's grace, I've been free of these addictions and I haven't had a drink of alcohol in over 27 years. God's grace. Today, there are many people here in San Pedro that are addicted to lots of different things. And the worst thing is that they've given up even trying to be free. That's the worst thing. I reached the point where I was totally convinced that without the grace of God in my life, I would never be free. And I would say, this thing is stronger than me. And I remember falling to my knees many a time and crying out to the Lord for His grace. And He taught me a huge lesson in that time of my life. And I learned that we first have to face God in a humble prayer before we can face our giants and be victorious over them. And praise God, I was able to overcome my addictions, and that means you too can. You also can. And I know that if one day that I think I'm doing it with my own willpower, and my own strength, and I think, well, I don't need God anymore. I'm doing fine. That day I'll fall big time. Thank God that the Holy Spirit taught me early on that without His grace, I can do nothing. Nothing good at least. So do me a favor. Please tell the person next to you, without God's grace, you can do nothing. Could you say that to them? Without God's grace, you can do nothing. That's true. And remember, when things get difficult, just take one day at a time, man. Like the song says, one day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. You know, when things get even more difficult, then just take it one hour at a time. And when things get like incredibly difficult, just take it one moment at a time. By embracing your weakness as an incredible opportunity to experience God's amazing grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your amazing grace. Help us to recognize our need for you every day and to rely on your grace every moment of our lives. May your power be perfected in our weakness and may we always trust in your unfailing love. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.